Hi, and welcome to this conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. My name is Chris Hudspeth. I'm the radio program manager for MS Focus Radio uh, and for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. Aaron Boster, who'll be talking tonight about making MS boring. After the presentation, Dr. Boster will open it up for questions and comments, and let me introduce Dr. Boster. Aaron Boster is a board-certified neurologist and fellowship trained MS specialist practicing in Columbus, Ohio. He knew he wanted to be a multiple sclerosis doctor when he was 12 years old, when he promised his mother and grandmother he would learn to take care of patients better and the doctors taking care of, uh, better than the doctors taking care of his uncle Mark. It has been Dr. Boster's mission to improve the lives of people impacted by MS through his research, direct patient care, and advocacy efforts. Many of you may be familiar uh, with his popular MS YouTube channel, where he publishes weekly videos intended to energize, educate, and empower people impacted by MS. We're delighted to have you, Dr. Boster, with us today and the fantastic topic of making MS boring. Please oh, hi. take it away. Wow, and what a, what a fantastic introduction. I want to thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank the MS Foundation for this opportunity. Howdy, everyone. How are you today? Now, I can't hear you because you're on mute, but that doesn't mean that you can't respond with a really loud howdy. So if you're in your living room, I want every person in the house to hear you respond on the count of I unmuted. One, I unmuted. Two, three. Howdy. 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 All right, guys. Howdy. Well, my name is Aaron Boster, and thank you for taking some time out of your evening to learn about multiple sclerosis with me. I am really, really excited to be on camera with you tonight. Um, it sort of feels a little bit like a fireside chat. Uh, I don't have the fireplace on, um, but I've got my apple juice ready, and I am ready to talk to you about something that I'm rather passionate about, and that's how to kick MS in the teeth. I decided to be an MS doctor when I was 12 years old, uh, not because my Uncle Mark had MS. He had had MS for a very long time, uh, but I remember very vividly coming into my grandmother's kitchen. My grandmother and mother were sitting at the kitchen table, and they were holding hands, and they were crying. And they weren't crying because Uncle Mark had MS. He was in the other room in a wheelchair watching TV. They were crying because they were frustrated. He was having a problem, and they couldn't get a hold of their doctors. And so I told my mom, I said, Mom, I'm going to learn to do it better. Now, I had no idea what I was actually telling my mom. I didn't know that I would complete the 27th grade of school or that I would become essentially bald by the, fin the time I finished my training. I just knew that nobody should make my family feel that scared and that alone. In fact, I don't think anyone should make any family feel that scared and that alone. And I set off on a rather targeted trajectory. Um, I've had a passion to help people impacted by MS live their best lives despite having the condition. And that sent me to college and med school and residency and fellowship and way too much schooling. And it is a great honor and privilege uh, that I've started the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio. Now, I do a lot of work in social media. And maybe I've seen some of you before on social media. And I think it is an awesome opportunity to connect with a larger community. Because let's face it, guys, we are members of a giant community supporting one another. And that's why we're here today. Now, very often, community members will ask me, hey, Dr. B, when will we have a cure? When's the cure for MS coming? And humbly, I'll share with you that I don't believe that in my lifetime we'll cure multiple sclerosis. I don't think that we're going to cure the disease before I move on. And that is not intended to be a gloom and doom statement. We don't cure most things in medicine. We don't cure diabetes. We treat it. Uh, we don't cure heart disease, we treat it. And I want to share something really impactful with you. Right now, today, 2020, we can make this disease boring. Today, not, not later, not in the future, not something coming down the horizon, but in the now, we literally can make this disease boring. And that's relevant for many reasons. I want you to live your most bright life. I want you to have fun in the ball field, in the boardroom. I want you to have lots of fun in the bedroom. I want the clinic to be boring. And today, over the next hour, I'm going to teach you how we do that. 
Now, as we hope and wait for a cure, as research is ongoing, I need you to be as fit as possible. I need your brain to be as in shape as it can be. I need to preserve the neurological reserve so that if and when the new therapy comes, you're eligible to receive it. And what I'm gonna share with you now is exactly what I do in my clinical practice, working to make your MS boring. And I do that in four ways. There are four things that we're gonna talk about tonight to make MS boring. The first one is treating an attack. So if you were taking notes right now, you'd write number one, circle, treat attack. An attack, a flare, an exacerbation, a relapse, it's all the same thing. It's when something bad neurologically happens to you, and after a couple of days, you can't hide it anymore, and you have to come clean and tell your spouse that you can't see out of your right eye, or that you can't feel your leg, or that your hand doesn't work. An attack is not something we plan for, and it is not boring. And so it is very, very important as one of the four things that we want to do to slow down MS and make it boring is to quickly identify an attack and then to smush it. And so let's talk about how we do that. Step number one, if you have a new neurological symptom lasting longer than a day, call your doctor. Allow me to repeat. If you have a new neurological symptom, something that you haven't had in the past, and now you have it, and 24 hours have gone by and it's still going on, holler at your provider. Now, on the other end of the phone, the proper answer is come into the office so we can see you. Now, the other caveat is if you have, instead of a new thing you've never had before, if you have a symptom that you had a long time ago, it's been gone for quite some time, and now it's come back to revisit you, and it's sticking around for longer than a day, call your provider. And the proper answer on the other end of the phone should be, come in and let me see you. Now, what the provider should be doing is number one, they should be taking what you say seriously. Why? Because you are a you expert. You are quite literally the most qualified person on earth to know about you. In fact, you've been with you since the very first day. You know everything there is to know about you. And so when you tell the provider, something's not right, I have a symptom lasting longer than a day, they should say, well, come in and let me see you. The second thing that they should do is they should rule out an infection. Say, well, why? Uh, I don't have an infection, I have a numb leg. The reason is because sometimes the human being can experience a neurological symptom and it can be because of an attack, but sometimes it can be the reemergence of old symptoms in the setting of an infection, even an infection that we're not yet aware of, something like a urinary tract infection. So when I have a patient that lets me know that something ain't right, and it's been going on for longer than a day, and they get their tush in the clinic, the first thing we do is we check a urinalysis. And we want to make sure that they don't have what's called an occult urinary tract infection. If we identify an infection, we're going to treat the infection. But if we can cross infection off the list, now we have someone with MS, with new symptoms, with findings on exam, there's no infection, and we're gonna hasten the recovery by using lotions and potions to make them get better faster. How do we do that? We have steroids, we have different flavors of steroids. We can take steroids orally, we can take steroids through an IV, we can take injections. There's a zillion different ways to slice it and dice it, but the point is, I wanna get you better quicker. I want to quell the inflammation in your brain and spinal cord, and I want to get you back into play. Now, I think as a best practice, the after you're given a course of steroids, you need to come back and see the provider six weeks later. And you need to come back six weeks later to make sure that you've gotten better, because if you haven't, we're not done yet. I want to make MS boring, and attacks are not boring. And so I want to hasten the recovery uh, from an attack. It's important to rule out a pseudo attack. That's uh, symptoms triggered by an infection like a urinary tract infection. And then it's important to treat that attack. After we treat the attack, I believe firmly that we need to follow up in the clinic to make sure that we're better. Now, I wanna share with you that if you are on oral birth control and you get pregnant, it didn't work. Right? So if you're taking birth control pills and you get knocked up and now you're pregnant, then it didn't work. That was an unsuccessful application of birth control. If you're taking an MS medicine, a disease modifying therapy, 
and you have an attack, it didn't work because that was a birth control pill against a future attack. And so that drug just failed you. Now, I hope you heard my words. I didn't say that you failed that drug because people don't fail drugs. Drugs fail people. And if you're taking a disease modifying therapy the way that you're supposed to, you're doing what the docs asked you to do. You're doing the shots or the infusions or the pills or what have you, and you have breakthrough disease. That's what it is. It's breakthrough disease. It busted through the uh, medicine that you were using. Then what we need to do is we need to think critically about that medicine. And so if you have new symptoms lasting longer than a day, you need to go to the attention of your provider. They need to see you. They need to evaluate you. They need to make sure you don't have a fever or an infection. And then they need to treat you with some medicine like steroids. And then they need to follow up with you to make sure that you're better. And when they follow up with you, we have to think very critically about that medicine, about that disease modifying therapy. See, and I'll get to this in probably about 30 minutes, but we take disease modifying therapies, we date our therapies. We don't marry them. We're going on dates with our therapies. And as long as they're a gentleman, as long as they behave properly, we're going to keep on keeping on. But if we have breakthrough disease, that is not the goal of that therapy. It's kind of the way I think about if a gentleman suitor was inclined to take my daughter out on a date and he brought her home late. Now, the first time he brings my daughter home late, we're going to sit down and we're going to have a little discussion about the rules at the Boster household and the expectations of when he brings my daughter home. And depending on how we feel, maybe he gets a second try. But if he dares bring my daughter home late a second time, we're done. Now, I want to let all of you potential gentlemen suitors know that my daughter is 12 and she's not allowed to start dating until she's 35, but I am preparing myself emotionally for that eventuality. And the same rules that we apply to my daughter's dating apply to disease modification, that we are dating our drugs and they better do a good job or we're going to kick it to the curb. This talk is all about making MS boring. And I told you there's four ways we wanna do that. The first way is by treating an attack because attacks aren't boring and so we wanna crush them. And that's the first one. And I'm gonna transition from the first point to the second point by drinking some apple juice. That is really good apple juice, wow. Okay, so number two in making MS boring, treating chronic symptoms. See, symptoms are things that suck. Symptoms are things that we don't like. So if you have an MS attack, which causes your leg to feel like it's numb and burny, and then you get steroids and you get 90% better, you're left with 10% burny sensation of your leg. And that can become a chronic symptom. And that's super duper annoying. If I treat your attacks and I slow your MS down, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and you are miserable because of chronic symptoms, I have not done my best job. And I wanna do my best job. So in order for me to feel proud, to come home to my family and say, today daddy did a good job, I need to do two things. I need to slow your disease down and I need to improve the quality of your life. I have to improve the quality of your life by treating chronic symptoms. And so at our center, we take symptoms very, very seriously. I like to joke that I have a pill for every ill. And I'm not gonna give you a pill for every ill because you're young and healthy and you don't wanna take a bunch of medicine and I don't wanna give you a bunch of medicine. But if something is bothering you enough, I wanna treat it. Now, sometimes the thing I'm treating, I treat with a pill. Sometimes a pill is a psychotherapist. Sometimes a pill is a speech pathologist. Sometimes a pill is a support group. Sometimes a, a pill is a bicycle. But the point is, is that I want to make those symptoms better. And I ask that if you have a chronic neurological symptom, something that bothers you, I want you to write it on a piece of paper. This is a pro tip, guys. Write it down on a piece of paper and bring it to your neurologist. When you go to see your neurologist, you should have your notebook with all your questions listed out and say, hi, I have questions. And this is very important because your neurologist is not gonna be able to let you go until he or she has addressed all the questions. And this way you don't forget that you have a chronic symptom that's bothering you. And you can say, wait a second, I've got this symptom and I don't like it. What are we gonna do about it? Now, I'll give you an example of treating a symptom. One of my favorite examples, male erectile function. 
right? I'm a big fan. And many gentlemen enjoy obtaining an erection. Now, some gentlemen with multiple sclerosis can develop difficulties with erectile function. Not all of them, but some of them can. And if you have MS and you have erectile dysfunction and you don't like it, well, then I give you a little blue after dinner mint. Now, that little blue after dinner mint doesn't do anything to slow down MS. It doesn't do anything to speed up MS, but it sure as heck can make Friday night awesome, right? And that improves the quality of life. But what about a gentleman with MS who has erectile dysfunction and doesn't care? Well, we don't give him a blue after dinner mint because that's not bothering him. On a case by case basis, we're going to look at the things that you don't like very much. And then your provider should give you a list, a potpourri, a, a, a list of options. We could do this, 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 this. And then you should say, no, no, yes, no, yes, yes, maybe tell me more. And we should custom tailor how we improve the, the quality of your life by raising symptoms. Now, when I think about treating symptoms, I'm always thinking about the invisible nature of multiple sclerosis. So you don't have to go to doctor school if your left leg stops moving, right? You don't need to go to doctor school to be like, hmm, maybe that's not good for you. But MS is very rarely that overt. And oftentimes, you can have horrible symptoms that the world can't see. Show of hands right now, how many of you have ever heard the equivalent of, but honey, you look so good. Oh, sweetie, well, you don't look sick. It always makes me want to say, yeah, and you don't look stupid. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about invisible symptoms in MS. And there are two groups of invisible symptoms that I think are very, very important. The first group of invisible symptoms are the up there's. The up there's are mood, energy levels, and cognition. And so the up there's are very, very important. And if you're having difficulty with thinking and memory, if you're having profound pathologic fatigue, if you're having feelings of being sad, blue, depressed, crying spells, anxiety, the world can't see that. And honey, you look so good. And yet they can destroy the quality of your life. Did you guys know that the leading causes of loss of work amongst Americans with MS are cognitive impairment and fatigue? You can work in a wheelchair, but you can't work if you can't think, and you can't work if you can't stay awake. And so if we could unmute the line long enough that somebody can shout out a number, don't shout it out yet, a number between two and 10. I need somebody to give me a number between two and 10. Could somebody please do that? Six. Six it is. So I'm going to list six ways that we can treat the triad of the up there's. So that's thinking and memory, mood and energy levels. And before you say, well, wait, 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 those are three separate symptoms. No, they're not. They're tied together with a bow. MS is very lovely that way. Because what I've learned over the past 15 years of treating MS is if one of them is impaired, it affects the other two. And if I improve one, I improve the other two. So I'm gonna list six things that we can do to improve the up there's. Number one is to take a disease modifying therapy for Rizzle. I'm being totally serial with you. The reason I say that is there's excellent evidence that disease modifying therapies maintain cognition. Allow me to repeat, disease modifying therapies, particularly the newer drugs have been shown to improve cognition. Can I get an amen? All right. Amen. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna assume somebody said amen on the interwebs. Um, the second thing that we have to think about as it relates to disease modifying therapy is DMTs in clinical trials improve mood. L literally, people that take DMTs compared to placebo, their moods are improved. And likewise, very, very clearly, DMTs can improve energy levels. So the first of the six things that we're going to list to improve the triad of the up there's is to take a disease modifying therapy. Number two, make sure you're getting enough sleep. I'm talking about the hours of sleep. And so most red-blooded Americans require eight hours, not five, not four, but eight hours of sleep. I wonder if the people listening to me right now got eight hours of sleep last night. And you know if you did or you didn't. Think about that for a second. I've got Casey shaking her head going, nope. No. <laughs> 
And the reality is that most of us cheat ourselves. We cheat a little bit. You know, we, we stay up because we want to watch the late show and we want to watch the late, late show. And then we still get up at six. So I am guilty of this as well. You know, I have a busy life. Um, I'm busy at work. Um, I'm doing lots of things. My house doesn't really get quiet until about 9 p.m. So 9 p.m. might be the first time that I say, oh, hello, wife. Nice to meet you. How are you today? Now, oh, hello. And, and we may want a little bit of adult time. And I'm not talking about like sexy fun time. I'm talking about like sit on the couch and stare at the TV and just take a deep breath and relax. Oh, and we don't want to go to bed yet because we want our adult time. And so we start to cheat and we may stare at the boob tube from 9 p.m. until midnight. And then we go to bed and we get up at five in the morning. Midnight to one, two, three, four, five. That's not eight hours. So I have a challenge for all of you. My challenge is to steal back one hour of sleep. If you normally go to bed at midnight, I double dog dare you to try to go to bed at 11 and see what happens. I actually already know what's going to happen. It's miraculous. Your next day is power packed because you recharged your battery. And that is really, really impactful. So tip number two out of six tips to improve the up there's is to steal back an hour of sleep. Now tip number three is still about sleep because sleep has a major impact on cognition, fatigue, and mood. And that's to make sure that you're not destroying your sleep architecture by getting up to go potty all night long. Show of hands right now, if you get up more than twice a night to go pee pee, and I'm raising my hand because I do. <laughs> now, if you're getting up more than twice a night to go pee pee, you're interrupting the quality of your sleep. You're waking yourself up and you have to stumble to the bathroom and try to get it in the toilet and stumble back and get back in bed and it messes up your sleep. So here's a pro tip, try to drink two thirds of all the water you're gonna drink in the first half of the day. So if you're, you're gonna front load all the water you're gonna drink, you're really gonna hit the water hard in the morning. Most of us don't do that. And then try to have a relative hard stop to the, to the fluid drinking after the dinner hour, right? Now you don't need to starve yourself from fluids and walk around your house going don't do that. I mean, you know, you need a little sip of something, have a little sip of something like, for example, apple juice. Ah. But if you drink two thirds of all the fluid you're going to drink in the first half of the day, and then you have a relatively hard stop at the dinner hour, you're not going to enter the bed making urine because when you drink something, whether that be water, milk, or apple juice, you're going to make urine for about five to six hours. So if you bring the water bottle to the bedside table, and you get in bed around midnight, you're going to make urine all the way until the morning, and you may have to get up to empty your bladder. And you can help yourself simply by stacking the water up front. Now, I said that there are six things, and I've only gone over two, so let's do a couple more, all right? We're talking about things that we can do to help with thinking and memory, and we're talking about things that we can do to help with energy and to help with depression. And the next answer is exercise is part of your lifestyle. People with MS and people without MS who exercise as part of their lifestyles consolidate their sleep. They have more energy during the day. Statistically, their mood improves and cognition improves. Exercise can be free. Now, I'm not asking you to become an Olympic athlete. I'm asking you to exercise as part of your lifestyle. And so I'll teach you a pro tip for that also. Many of you on the call have a piece of gym equipment that you bought about five to 10 years ago. And it is the most expensive thing in the bedroom that you hang your clothes on, right? You, you, you put your hanger on it, you hang your shirts on it, you hang your dress on it. Sometimes you throw your towel on it um, and it's covered up in clothes and you're not using it. So here's a pro tip. Take that elliptical, treadmill, stationary bicycle, sled, whatever it is, and drag it into the living room, the living room, right? So that's not very feng shui, but I want it to be in the living room. It needs to be in the room where you end your day. So you're sitting in the living room, watching the boob tube, kind of chilling out, trying to relax, and you're watching TV, and you look over, and there's that gosh darn elliptical that Boster made you stick in the living room. During a commercial, stand on it. Just pedal for 
four minutes, three minutes, however long commercial is. And when the commercial's over, go sit back down. If you watch two hours of TV with commercials, some of you youngsters don't know about commercials. Um, and you would get four times an hour, you jump on that elliptical. In two hours, you'd get on that bike almost 20 minutes. Now, if you are a millennial who only streams uh, Netflix, at the end of every Netflix show, get on the elliptical for five minutes. What you'll find is that you commit yourself to tricking yourself into a little bit of exercise, and it's gonna do magical, wonderful things. So I think I've now done three of the six. I'm not really sure, but what the hey, hey, we'll just keep going. Oh, we've done four? Casey's trying to hook a brother up. Thank you for that, so I just need to do two because four plus two is six. So I'm jet set, let's do two more. Another thing that you can do to help with energy levels, to help with mood and to help with thinking and memory is to streamline your medication list. Did you know that about on average, the American MS patient takes seven medicines? That's a lot of medicines. Doctors are very good at giving medicines we're very bad at taking away medicines. So you may see a doctor says, ooh, let me give you this pill. And then a different doctor says, let me give you this pill. Oh, and try this pill, and then this pill, and this pill, and this pill. And pretty soon you're on all these medicines and they can have side effects. And sometimes those side effects can cause sedation, confusion, they can cause mood problems. And so each time you go to your doctor, any doctor, I want you to ask them which medicines can be removed. Which medicines can we cut in half? Which medicines do I not need? Which medicines can we consolidate? And if your doctor wants to add a pill, tell her she has to remove a pill. Now, this is not a pill. This is a collar stay. I'm just playing with it. Um, so as, as your doctor wants to add a pill, tell them they have to remove a pill because we don't want to stack up medicines. Because too many medicines, and we have a doctor term for that, it's called polypharmacy. That's bad news bears. And that can make you exhausted. Many, many of the very best symptomatic medicines have side effects which impact thinking and memory, cognition, they impact mood, they impact energy levels. Things like medicines to treat spasticity, medicines to treat actually depression, medicines to treat pain, medicines that we use for good reasons, they can muck us up. And so that's something for us to consider. Now, the last one that I want to talk about is diet. It's my belief that you can improve your energy levels, you can improve your mood, and you can actually think more clearly by cleaning up your diet, for real. Now, if you were to ask me, hey, Aaron, is there a diet that's been proven to slow MS? I would say absolutely not. There's no diet on earth today, which has been proven to slow multiple sclerosis, but we're talking about chronic symptoms. And I am a very firm believer, after doing this for quite some time, that if you adopt a certain diet, it can improve symptoms quite a bit. I have had patients which almost have like a Lazarus effect, where they get rid of symptomatic medicines, they have more energy, they think more clearly, they perform better on testing, and they didn't take a magical drug, they just cleaned up their diet. So what am I talking about? I challenge you to do the following. Avoid soda, avoid fast food, because that's not actually real food, that's fake food, it's not real. Avoid highly processed foods, avoid fried foods, avoid foods that have ingredients that you can't pronounce. So if you look at the ingredients and it has a bunch of words that you can't pronounce, that's not food, that's a chemical. Don't eat that. I want you to eat foods that have ingredients like chicken, broccoli, water, apple juice, right? Those are real foods. And so if you think that I'm cray cray, well, maybe I am, but I challenge you for one month to eat a whole food, a real food diet and see what happens. Over the last 15 years, as I've asked patients to periodically do that, most of the time they say, but every once in a blue moon, they do it. And it's always awesome to see what happens because it changes everything. It's really, really powerful. Now, I told you that when I think about managing symptoms, I think about the up there's and I think about the down there's. What are the down there's? 
Well, the down there's are also invisible symptoms, bowel, bladder, and sexual function. And most adults really like to control their bladder. It's like a thing, like we're very into bladder control. We don't want to be wet and we don't want to risk being wet. And it's such a, a, a profound thing that if we don't have control of our bladder, what do we do? We hide. We literally, we won't go outside. I'm not going to church. Heck no, I'm not going to church because I am not going to risk having a bladder accident. Or we just stop drinking water. Both of those things are not okay with me. Both of those things need to be combated. And so we have to take very seriously the invisible symptoms of bowel, bladder, and sexual function. And so I need somebody to shout out uh, a number. Let's do between one and 10. A number three. between one. Three. Okay. Three it is. All right, three. So, so for three, we're going to do three things to improve sexual function. Why? Because it's provocative and, and everybody enjoys. So what are three things that we can do to improve sexual function? Well, thing number one is we can communicate with our partner. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes, we have anxieties about performance, about whether or not we'll satisfy our partner. We'll have concerns about things going on with us. Maybe there's neuropathic pain with intercourse, or maybe what... And if you can have a pre-sex discussion with your partner and you can share where your fears and concerns are, I think that you'll find that you're dealing with someone who loves you and you're dealing with someone who will listen to you and you will find a way to avoid this thing that's uncomfortable or to consider this thing which seems to work better. And it can miraculously change a lot of life. Um, it can improve intercourse, which can improve everything. And so that's tip number one is literally chit chat with your partner, right? Talk with your clothes on, have a discussion, have an adult discussion about the things that bug you, the things that you want to try to accomplish, difficulties that you may have. I guarantee that your partner has been hopeful that you would share those thoughts, right? Because it, it's, it's, it's important to have a successful intimate relationship. It's very important. And I challenge you to have a conversation. Say, I saw this little weird balding guy and he said, I'm supposed to talk to you about sex. See what happens. It might turn out to be a really good Monday night. Now, the second tip that I'm gonna provide is a mega tip. So if I had like a, a sound machine, I would make it go dun, 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 dun. So the, the second tip is the vibrator trick, all right? Now, if, if you are listening to me right now, I'm using my indoor voice. I'm not screaming, I'm just talking at a normal indoor voice because there's very little interference between my mouth and your earphones. So you, you can hear me okay. But imagine that I was giving this virtual lecture in a giant lecture hall and everybody was talking, right? Suddenly I have to scream at the top of my lungs because there's so much interference between my mouth and your ears that if I don't scream at the top of my lungs, you literally can't hear what I have to say. Sometimes sexual dysfunction in MS is the exact same thing because there's damage to the spinal cord, the superhighway that takes all the information from the down there's and brings it to the up there's to tell the up there's, Hey dude, guess what? And then to send a message back down to the down there's to be like, oh, right. And so that message has to go up and down the spinal cord. And if you have damage to your spinal cord because of MS, the message can literally die along the way. It's like me talking softly in a crowded room, right? So the trick is to, is to do two things. Number one, water-based lubricant, right? A water-based lubricant in, increases skin sensitivity. Number two, plug in the wall vibrator. Now, I am not talking about a double D battery rabbit. No, 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 That is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about the real deal Holyfield, plugging the vibrator in the wall because you need DC power to provide overdrive stimulation to alert the down there's what's going on. And this is true for both boys and girls. Gentlemen, if you take that plug in the wall vibrator and you hold it to the glands penis, the shaft of the penis, the head of the penis, underneath the testicles, you are going to provide overdrive stimulation and the down there's will send a message to the up there's saying, oh yeah. And then it'll send a message back down. And many, many times we can have meaningful intercourse 
with the assistance of the vibrator trick. It's for boys and girls. So, so that is a mega tip to help you as you overcome issues related to sexual function. Now, it'll be very interesting to see if the MS Foundation ever invites me ever again to give a discussion. <laughs> and they may have caveats like, Aaron, please, for the love of all that's holy, do not talk about sex. But they're stuck because I have one more because I said I would do three. So what's the third one? The third one is to consider certain aspects of MS that can interfere with feeling sexy. So for example, if you are horribly constipated, hard to feel sexy. If you have a full bladder, hard to feel sexy. If your leg is having extensor spasms, hard to feel sexy. And so sometimes we have to game out other symptoms to make sex meaningful. And I'll use spasticity as an example. If you have a tendency for your leg to go into a flexor spasm, that'll drop a man. That hurts really bad. And it is super hard to maintain your groove thing when your leg is spasming. So we may need to treat your spasticity in order to make the bedroom more meaningful. See what I did there? We want to improve the quality of your life. We identified that sex is an issue, and then we figured out what was not working so that we could make it better. I want to tell you a very brief story about a gentleman um, proud to take care of. He has a progressive form of MS and he has really, really bad spasticity. And he has a baclofen pump. So this baclofen pump delivers baclofen to his spinal cord, which relaxes his legs. And it gives a small amount of baclofen all the time. And before he would have an MRI, because he couldn't lay flat without spasming, we would bolus his pump. We would, he would come to the clinic and we'd, give, we'd program his pump to give an extra bo bolus of baclofen so that he could be loose in the scanner. Well, I'm having a conversation with him and his wife and they're having some major problems with sexual function because he has extensor spasms of his legs, which is super painful. And so they were unable to have meaningful intercourse. And then they thought, well, some doctor said, well, let's try Valium. And Valium worked great. He didn't have spasms except he fall asleep during intercourse and his wife didn't like that very much and he didn't like that very much. So that didn't work very well. Ha ha. Then we realized that we could use the baclofen pump. We figured out a way that we gave him a magical programmer where he could hit a button and he could make his pump give himself a bolus. So before intercourse, boink, he would give himself a bolus. It would relax his legs to get a meaningful sex. And I felt like I was like the best doc ever because this was a really cool idea. And it allowed him to have a more meaningful relationship with his wife, which I felt really good about. So the, the topic of this conversation is making MS boring. I said, the first way that we do that is by treating relapses. And the second way we do that is by treating symptoms that bother you. And your only responsibility is to bring to the attention of your doctor symptoms that bother you. And I encourage you to write them down in a notebook and bring them to your doctor and say, whoa, whoa, whoa what about these symptoms? These are things that I don't like very much and I want you to help me treat them. And I wanted to highlight today two constellation of symptoms, the up there's and the down there's. The up there's being thinking and memory, energy and mood, invisible symptoms, and the down there's, bowel, bladder, and sexual function. And so that's the second of the four things that I know about to make MS boring. And now for number three, after a short sip of apple juice. Man, it's good. Apple juice with ice is better. All right, so number three in making MS boring is what I like to call disease-modifying therapies with an S. Disease-modifying therapies with an S because there are four things that I'm aware of that will slow down your MS. And so I have this cutesy saying, I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. I want you to be four for four because there are four things that I know about. And I, on the count of three, I want all of you to say really loudly four for four. So your families are going to be like, what is she doing? All right. So on the count of three, we're going to scream four for four on the count of one, two, three, four, 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 four. 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 All right. I really hope that bothered all of your families and they're like, what's going on in the living room? So what does it mean to be four for four in your fight against MS? It means there's four things that I know about that slow down MS. And I want you to do all four of them. Number one, don't smoke cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes speeds up MS. It does. It makes MS get faster. Did you know 
that if you smoke cigarettes, you double your risk of contracting, of developing MS for real? Did you know that if you already have MS and you smoke, you're speeding up your disease by some accounts by 50%. Did you know that quitting smoking slows down MS? That's a really, really big deal. Now, if you're a smoker, it's super, super challenging to quit smoking, right? I'm not suggesting that it's like easy peasy. It's actually not. It's arguably one of the hardest things that an adult has to do. And yet, stopping smoking, quitting smoking slows down multiple sclerosis. And so I would be a really bad doctor if I didn't bring that up during the clinic visit. And you have the right... To, to tell me how you're really doing. I'm allowed to say, hey, how are you smoking? You say, I'm smoking great, thank you. That's okay, right? But I have to bring it up to you. Now, there are three phases to quitting smoking. Actually, there's four. Phase number one is the pre-contemplative phase, which is the doctor way of saying, talk to the hand, I'm not quitting, All right? And then there's the contemplative phase, which is, eh, I'm not really gonna quit, but I'll listen to what you have to say. I'm, I'm thinking about it. Then there's the active quitting phase, and then there's the hard part, which is the maintenance phase. And I wanna give you a pro tip for thinking about quitting smoking, right? Now, I have a bunch of videos on my YouTube channel where I talk about this, and if you wanted to hear it for a long time, you can check that out. But in brief, I'm gonna share a, one pro tip on things to do to get ready to quit smoking. Here it is. I want you to identify the three key cigarettes. Every single smoker on this webinar knows exactly what I'm talking about. The three key cigarettes. It's typically the one when I wake up, the one when I come home from work, and the one after dinner before I go to bed. These are the cigarettes that if somebody were to interrupt you, you would murder them so that you could finish your cigarette, right? They're, they're emotionally impactful cigarettes. And I'll use the I wake up in the morning and I have a cigarette before I start my day cigarette, okay? That cigarette serves two purposes, not one, but two purposes. It's a nicotine delivery device because of the nicotine addiction and it's emotional. It's an emotional cigarette. It provides a transition to our day. In this example, it's how we start our day. When you come home from work, it's the deceleration cigarette. These cigarettes have emotional value. So here's the pro tip. I want after you- After sex too. After sex, that's a great one. So um, it's the after, so let's use the after sex cigarette. Okay, so we finish intercourse, all right? We used the vibrator trick, it was fantastic. Um, bells and whistles went off, we were very excited. And now it's time for the after sex cigarette, all right? I want you to pull the cigarette out of the pack, I want you to smell it. Ah, and then I want you to say to yourself, self, I will smoke the cigarette in one hour. And I want you to put it on the table. Now, during the next hour, you can look at the cigarette, you can pick it up, you can touch it, you can smell it. You can't light it, all right? You need to make yourself wait an hour, right? And, and you may need to mute your line because we're getting a little bit of feedback. I just wanna make sure that everybody can hear me talk about sex and smoking cigarettes. Um, and so we want to delay smoking the blue cigarette for one hour, right? You, you're gonna smoke it, you're gonna, it's right there, you're holding it, but you're gonna make yourself wait an hour. The reason you're gonna make yourself wait an hour is because we're gonna decouple the nicotine delivery device from the emotional value of the cigarette. Many, many smokers try to quit cold turkey and they're, they're smoking 20 cigarettes a day and they immediately get rid of five and then they get rid of 10, they get rid of 15. They're down to three cigarettes and then it's hard, right? The cigarettes that didn't matter, they got rid of quickly but they're left with those key cigarettes. And very often I realize that people then start smoking more, all right? They, they go back up to 20. So I want you, before you quit, to reverse engineer it. I want you to remove the time point, and then I want you later down the line to quit. When you go to quit later, that, that cigarette that had the emotional value is no longer valuable. It's no longer relevant. All right, so, I said that there were four things to slow down MS and I've only talked about two. So what are the other two? So the next one is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Oh, I've only done one, I gotta do three. So exercise is part of your lifestyle. So what does it mean to exercise as part of your lifestyle? I talked a little bit earlier about the value of exercise. Did you know that people with MS that exercise as part of their lifestyle quite literally end up less disabled when they're older? Think about that for a second. If you 20 years from now could talk to you today 
you 20 years from now would say, gosh darn it, exercise, because you're gonna be more functional 20 years from now. And exercising is hard. I gave you a pro tip earlier about exercise. I'll give you one more pro tip about exercise. Are you ready? Water is magic. Water is magical. If you can get in the water, all right, put a life jacket on and get in the swimming pool. Do water Zumba, walk in the water, swim if you want to. In the water, you weigh less. So the weak leg can handle your weight better. In the water, if you're off balance and you fall to the left, the water pushes back to the right. If you have heat sensitivity because you're down in Florida and it is hot, then the water will pull the heat off your body. And so sometimes you can get exercise done in the pool that you can't get done elsewhere. Water is magical. And I, I want you to make exercise part of your lifestyle. I've given two pro tips for exercise. It's really, really important. All right, so we talked about not smoking. We talked about exercise. Number three, whoa. Number three is diet, supplementing low levels of vitamin D and eating a clean diet. Low levels of vitamin D make MS get worse faster, right? So if you have a level of, MS, uh, of vitamin D less than 50, it will drive your disease faster than if it's above 50. And depending on where you live in the world, you may not have any sun. I mean, I live in Columbus, Ohio, where for seven months a year, give it up. I mean, it is gray skies, if at all, and it, there's not a lot of sun. And so we can supplement vitamin D with a little pill that we take, and it can raise the vitamin D. Now, I am not recommending that you run out and buy a bunch of vitamin D and take a bunch. I want you to talk with your doctor. I want you to have your vitamin D checked. And I want the goal of, of the level to be between 50 and 100. And that can slow down MS. Now, number four in being four for four in your fight against MS is to take a disease-modifying therapy, right? And I am not sitting here today telling you that the very best therapy for 999, if you sign up now, is fill in the blank. No, 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 no. What I'm telling you is we need to take a disease modifying therapy, whatever that therapy is, and we need to make sure it's working, right? When you're on the therapy, I don't want any attacks. I don't want any new spots on the MRI, and I don't want any change on your exam. And whatever therapy you're on, we need to constantly reevaluate and make sure it's working. We're dating our therapy. And as long as while you're on that therapy, you're not having attacks, you're not having new spots, you're not having uh, changes on your MRI, well, you're tolerating the drug. It's not causing safety concerns. We're going to keep on keeping on. But if things aren't okay in 2020 in the United States of America, there are 22 different formulations of MS medicines. In 15 years, I have failed finding a medicine for someone zero times. Think about that, right? I see MS patients five to six days a week, and I have failed zero times in getting someone on a medicine. It's all about working with someone to figure out what works, right? And if you tell me that no medicine works for you, um, I, I challenge that. And I would like a crack at trying to figure out if we can find something that you can take that you can tolerate that'll work to slow your disease down. All right, so that's being four for four in your fight against MS. Don't smoke cigarettes, exercise as part of your lifestyle, supplement vitamin D, take an MS medicine and make sure it's working. Now, I told you that there were four ways that I was gonna make MS boring. Right? I started off by talking about relapses, and then I talked about symptoms, treating chronic symptoms. Then I talked about disease modification. What's the fourth thing? That's the one that I'm going to end on, and that is mindfulness. This is new information that I'm sharing. It's not new concepts. It's just new coming from me, and it's the concept of mindfulness. What the heck is mindfulness? English, Aaron. Mindfulness is the idea of participating in activity where you are present in the now. All right. All too often in the setting of a chronic condition like MS, we spend a lot of time thinking about the past. Back when I was in high school, I did blank. I ran blank. I played football. I did this. I did that. And we live in the past about what could have been, what would have been, what I used to be able to do. And you can spend a tremendous amount of time in your mind living in the past. The other thing that we do with MS or with other chronic conditions is we tell ourselves make-believe movies in our brain. I'm going to lose my walking. My entire family's going to leave me. I'm going to end up on the street. I'm going to lose my ability to communicate. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to become destitute. I mean, you tell yourself these crazy stories. 
that are not based in reality. And I am asking you to consider an exercise of mindfulness, right? So I'm not asking you to become like a Zen master and to never speak for seven years and live in the forest in complete peace and harmony. No, I'm asking you to live your life more fully, but I am asking you to, to consider a couple exercises in mindfulness. And I'm going to share one with you right now after some apple juice. When you eat a meal, before you start eating, either after you say a prayer or instead of, I want you to take pause and think about and look at what's going on and go through all the different senses. Take pause and smell. Smell what you're eating. Even describe it to yourself. Pork chops, I want you to smell what you're eating. I want you to look at what you're eating. How does it look? Does it look delicious? Does it look like it was made with care? Does it look perfectly glazed? What's going on? What does it look like? I want you to think about what's around you. Who's at the table with you? What a gift that you get to eat sitting across from someone that loves you. What a gift that you can all have a moment where you're together enjoying something delicious. What do you hear? Are there birds chirping outside? Can you hear the hum of the fan in the other room? I want you to cut into your food and take a bite of it and really think about what you're eating. Taste it, all right? In other words, I don't want you to have the TV on and you're talking on the phone and you're doing far things and hold on. That's not mindfulness. I'm talking about sitting down and taking a bite and appreciating what you're doing. Now, you may think, okay, Aaron's lost it, but I double dog dare you to try this exercise in mindfulness, this moment of appreciation, this moment of reflection as you eat a meal with your family. I'll tell you a secret, it's life changing. And I challenge you to do that. Take pause from the movie in your mind about what may or may not happen. Stop thinking about what you've lost and, and who you used to be and spend a moment in the now. I spend a lot of time during the workday on camera, like this actually, using Zoom, doing telemedicine. I have talked to literally hundreds of families impacted by MS throughout the course of my work week. And I can share with you that every single person I've talked to, without exception, without exception, right now is suffering. The world is jacked up. There are bad things happening right now. There's a global viral pandemic. In my hometown of Columbus, Ohio, there's riots. I mean, it is a scary time. And it is very, very easy to get spun up and anxious and scared. And I am begging you to slow yourself down and to take a moment to be in the now. Now, Candy, who I absolutely adore, says, I live alone. So, so what do I do if I live alone? Well, Candy, two things. Number one, you can still enjoy what you're eating. You can prepare a meal and you can enjoy what you're eating. You can smell it and taste it and think about it. And I'm gonna kick it up a notch, Candy, you have a smartphone, right? And so FaceTime a loved one while you eat, for real. Call your, call your cousin, call your sister, call someone that you love and say, hey, I don't wanna eat by myself today. Eat a meal with me. Or just get on camera and have a communicate, have five minutes with them. It can be life-changing. My name's Aaron Boster, and I wanna thank you for learning about MS with me. I want to thank the MS Foundation for making this opportunity for us to get together and talk. And I want to thank all of you for caring enough about upping your game to give up an hour of your life to listen to me babble. I'm grateful. And if the communications experts on the line can help us, I would love to open up what we're doing so I can answer a few of your uh, questions. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Boster. Um, uh, so we are ready for questions. There are some, I have one for you, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, uh, so to ask a question, uh, please use the raise your hand feature in the app or send a question via chat. 
To raise your hand, click the screen. To pull up the menu, select more. It's the icon with the three little dots. Uh, click raise hand, uh, and then I'll unmute you, and then a button will appear. You're going to have to um, allow us uh, uh, so to select allow. Uh, I think the entire audience, just the main question is that uh, apple juice, local and organic. <laughs> um, this apple juice was squeezed in the great state of Kentucky. All right. Um, yeah, it, I don't believe it's organic, but it's fantastic. Yeah, it's very, very lovely. I'm in Vermont right now. We have some great apple juice here as well. So I, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew where the <laughs> apple juice was coming from. Yep. All right. Uh, we, do, <laughs> we do have uh, a couple of questions from email that we received earlier in the, uh, in the day. Um, there's a gentleman who says, I'm somewhat of a heavy male, currently being treated with Ocrevus. Since blood concentrations are affected by weight and positive outcomes of treatment are dependent on blood concentrations, how do I go about getting myself a fair dose? Uh, note that I'm very tall and cannot simply lose weight. Now, I will ask to, uh, for folks to allow me to um, unmute them on, on, uh, on our own and, and then we'll, we'll get to other questions. So again, if you could answer. So that was a great question. So the question was about one of the 22 formulations of MS medicines to slow down MS. And the question, the specific drug was ocrelizumab, ocrevus, which is an IV infusion in the vein taken twice a year. And it's a set dose at a set schedule. And if you read the package insert, it says that you dose it every 24 weeks. So a lot of American neurologists think 24 weeks is six months, but it's not, right? 24 weeks is not six months. 24 weeks is actually like five months. And so what we have learned is really fascinating. If you happen to be a larger dude or dudette, it turns out that you may have a smaller relative volume of distribution of the ocrevus, which is what this gentleman's talking about. And you may experience something that patients have coined the crap gap. Now, I didn't make up that term, um, but the crap gap refers to an experience that some people with MS have in the last month of ocrevus. And sometimes I think that that crap gap is associated with a, a uh, wearing off effect of the medicine. That's a little bit of conjecture on my part, but there actually is a little bit of science to support this. There's a, a, a study that was done and it was presented a year ago at the AAN. So not just like last month, but a year ago last month. And it suggested that people with a larger habitus, with a larger body size, may be more prone to have a wearing off effect or this so-called crap gap. Now, how do we combat that? Well, it's actually a straightforward thing. Instead of every six months, you can go every five months. And that is an on-label comment because the label says 24 weeks. And so instead of going six months, we go five months. And for a lot of people, that makes a huge difference, a very big difference. And so I would encourage anybody that's experiencing a potential wearing off effect to talk to their MS neurologist about going from six months to five months, which is on-label. All right. Uh, we have a question uh, in the Zoom chat, uh, not in the Zoom chat, who's going to be asked by Jessica. Jessica, I'm going to unmute you. Um, if you have a question, please go ahead. Yes. Um, so how long do you take, do you give a medication um, time, so to speak, for it to really see effectiveness? I've been on, on Copaxone for almost two months now. My first flare-up was in February of this year. Um, and in May, I had already been on Copaxone for a month, and I ended up having another flare-up. My current neuro wants to see me stay on it for another six to nine months. I beg to differ. I feel like it's maybe time to start looking for something that might be more effective. Um, what, what's your take? How long do you give a DMT? You know, one of the things that I love, 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 love about working with folks that have MS is you guys are wicked smart and motivated. That is a really good question. So thank you for asking that question. When you, when, when you assess the efficacy of a disease-modifying therapy, 
you have to take several things into consideration. One of them is how long does it take for the medicine to be working? Capaxone is not working after two months. It may take six to nine months before we feel confident that Capaxone is fully on board. So if you started Capaxone, glutamorastate, and then a month later or two months later had an attack, to be blunt, it's too early to assume that Capaxone failed us. It's too early. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to have an opinion about your disease-modifying therapy, because you are. That doesn't mean that you have to wait a year to decide, I don't like it, all right? But mechanistically, if you're trying to understand the onset of Capaxone, it can take a while. And so any disease activity, whether that be a new spot on MRI or a new attack in the first six months, it's not fair to blame Capaxone because Capaxone hasn't had time to work yet. That was a really good question. Thank you for asking it. All right, next up, we actually had um, an email from Vanessa, but it looks like she's actually on the line and can uh, ask the question in person. So Vanessa, go, let me see if I can unmute. One moment. One moment. Oh, there she is. Vanessa, go ahead with your question. Okay, I have it right here. I have it right here. Hi, Dr. Boster. I love Howdy. you. I love you. Okay, with regards to my MRI results, that state atrophy on the brain and spinal cord, can my body form new pathways around them to help with balance, foot drop, and cognitive issues if I continue physical therapy exercises at home and play, play brain games every day or is this just something that can't change because there is already too much damage? Very good question. So, so again, this is an example of a really thoughtful question. Can you rebuild? Can you rewire? Can you learn new skills and reinforce neurological systems? Yes. 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 You absolutely can. 100%. And so, you know, the, the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, that's a lie. You, you absolutely can. So can you improve your balance by physical therapy? Yes. Can you improve thinking and memory by brain games? Yes. Is it worthwhile to do that because it rewires your brain? Yeah, it's very, very worthwhile. And I want you to do that. Now, brain volume, so that's the measurement of how big your noggin is is something that we talk about more and more. And what we have found is people impacted by MS have an accelerated brain shrinkage. Their brain can literally get smaller faster. And that doesn't mean that they can't learn new things or they can't rewire. They can. And it's really, really important to do that. So if you're listening to this call and you've always wanted to learn how to make like a remote control airplane, please do that. If you have enjoyed listening to your children play piano and you've kind of wondered if it would be kind of cool to learn how to tickle the ivories, please do that. If you've wondered whether it would be fun to learn German or Russian, learn German or Russian. In doing those activities, training the brain can make you better. Um, it is not too late. And there is a wealth of things that you can do. You have control over that and you can push the envelope and make yourself get better. I wanna share one story with you about a man who is very important to me. Um, so I'll call him uh, Mr. L. So Mr. L was my algebra teacher when I was a freshman or in high school. I think I was a freshman in high school. And, and, and I just thought he was kind of a hard ass. I didn't really know him very well. I didn't really get to know him until years and years later when I was a professor at the Ohio State University and he became my patient with PPMS in an era where there was no treatment. And he was a really tall guy. Mr. L was like a big dude. I mean, I'm a big dude, but this guy was like 6'9". He was like a huge guy, right? He's really, really tall. 
And, and he was having increasing trouble walking. He was using his walker less and less and sitting in a chair more and more. And this was before drugs. And he was scared that he was going to lose his ability to walk. And so we came up with a plan. We put a life jacket on Mr. L and we put him in a swimming pool with a walker. So now he's in a swimming pool with a walker in the water wearing a life jacket. And he walked laps almost daily in the swimming pool with a life jacket with a walker. And he did that for months. And he came back to my clinic and my MA came and got me and said, Dr. B, Mr. L refuses to do the timed walk unless you come out in the hallway. So I came out in the hallway. And he looked at me and he said, young man, are you ready? I said, yes. And he picked up the walker and he walked 25 feet unassisted. Now, Mr. L didn't do that because of some magical medicine that only I knew about. He did that because he worked his ass off because he got himself in the pool and he rewired his brain to be able to walk. And that guy kept walking for several years. And he's passed away. And he's a very, very important person to me and his family. And he's an important person to you because I want you to understand that you can do what he did and you can rewire your brain. Hold on, we have a, looks like we have an unmuted uh, participant. My apologies. Got it. Um, okay, so um, thank you, uh, Dr. Boster, so far for answering all these questions, and and it's it's uh, amazing the stories you share, and just your your energy is is fantastic. Um, we do have a few more questions, and in, in case do it, man. to go to about eight fifteen, or until you know, the juice. Until the, until the big boss tells me I'm not allowed to be on <laughs> camera anymore, then I'm going to keep on keeping on, and she all hasn't right. told me that so far. So so far so good. All right. But all if right. I stay on, I'll just blame you and say that you made me do it. And then you'll have That's to right. do it. So let's, right. just, let's just keep going. <laughs> well, we have another uh, question uh, from uh, Shamsuddin. Shamsuddin, I apologize for uh, mispronouncing your, your name. Um, I'm going to unmute you and please ask your question. Uh, um, Go ahead. Morning. Hi. Yeah, I'm actually um, um, I'm actually connecting from Africa, of Nigeria, to be precise. Howdy. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Actually, I I really appreciate the effort of um, the multiple sclerosis um society because currently I'm I'm a researcher. Uh, that's an MSc student, master's degree student from um. Nigeria, and I'm currently working on multiple sclerosis. So it's really nice to be a part of this community. So we're, I'm actually um, engaging in a lot of research. Uh, currently, we, we try to work on um, some plant extracts to see if we can, the, those extracts can have some ameliorative properties on um, the disease. So actually, I'm just here to just show my support to the community. That's awesome. And I, and I wish you, uh, I wish everyone uh, a very a happy and a better day ahead. Thank That's you. That's awesome. What a, what, a, what a wonderful thing. You know, you, you remind us of something very, very important, that we are not alone. You know, throughout the world right now, many of us are quarantined. Many of us are forced to avoid contact with other people. And it can make us feel alone. It can make us feel like we're by ourselves. And we are not by ourselves, my friend. You are literally across an ocean from me. And the fact that we have a chance to communicate right now means the world to me. And it proves the point that there is a thriving community of people impacted by this disease. Doctors, scientists like yourself, researchers, family members, village members, people impacted by the disease directly. And we're all in this together. And one of the reasons why I was so terribly excited to accept this invitation from the MS Foundation was for the opportunity for us all to come together on a given evening and, and share our thoughts and our camaraderie. So 
I greatly appreciate your efforts, both in the laboratory and giving up some free time right now. So it's very nice to meet you, my friend. And thank you very, very much. All right. Uh, moving on, <laughs> moving on, we have a question from Sam. Uh, the only med for PPMS is Ocrevus. Uh, but I had hep, hep B 30 years ago and did develop antibodies. So what's the risk return for taking this med? So, so that's a very enlightened question. Um, to date, in the history of Ocrevus, there has never been one case of reactivation of hepatitis B. However, there has been cases of reactivation of hepatitis B with other anti-CD20 molecules. And so in the package insert for Ocrevus, Ocrelizumab, it says you're supposed to check to make sure that they don't have hepatitis. And what I'm hearing here is, hey, I had hepatitis and I've cleared it. So if you were in my clinic, I would not not give you Ocrevus. I would give you Ocrevus. I would first simply send you to a hepatologist. That's a very fancy Scrabble word, which means GI doctor specializing in the liver, a hepatologist. And the hepatologist would look over your things and he would probably write me a letter and say, dear Aaron, this person has mounted a immunity and cleared the virus. Go ahead and give them the therapy. Now, you bring up a really good point. There aren't other FDA approved therapies for MS. So we have to weigh the risk and the benefit of reactivation of hepatitis B against treating the MS. This has happened in my clinic. And I can tell you that every single case we have worked with a hepatologist and we have treated their MS. And so I don't want you to despair. I don't want you for a moment to think that that's not an option. There's just a couple extra steps that we might have to walk through to help ensure the safety when giving you that medicine. But it's not off the table, it's on the table. All right, we have another question from chat from Maria who asks, how advisable is it to go off your DMT after the age of 65? In a word that rhymes with ho, hell no. That's a really, really bad idea. So I strongly support the idea of treating your MS as long as two conditions are met. Number one, you have an immune system, and number two, you're alive. So if you're still alive and you have an immune system with MS, that immune system is still trying to attack you. And I think ageism is awful. I dislike ageism. And I dislike doctors that practice systemic ageism who would say, I, doctor so-and-so, declare that because you have reached the age of fill-in-the-blank, you're no longer allowed to take do to do If I was allowed to swear, I would swear, but I'll try to be very, very polite and say I disagree with that idea. I, as long as you have a, an immune system, and as long as you're still alive, I want to treat your MS. And as long as you have neurological functions that you like, things like seeing, eating, smelling, moving, then I want to keep those things. And let's say that you're in a wheelchair because you can't move your legs, but you can still move your arms. Well, do you, do you like moving your arms? And shouldn't we try to keep your arms functional? I think the answer is yes. So I think that stopping a medicine because you've achieved a birthday of X or Y is, is, is quite honestly stupid. And I don't agree with it. And I do think that it is reasonable to de-escalate your medicine. As your immune system quiets down, as you get a little bit older, I do think it's reasonable to de-escalate your medicine, but I don't take you off. Now, I have very, very strong opinions about this, as you may have picked up. And I, in my opinion, is not the only opinion, but you're stuck listening to me talk tonight, so I'll share my opinion. And if you were to check out my YouTube channel, I have several videos where I'm rather passionate and a little less PC as I share my opinions about this topic. I think it is categorically wrong to stop MS medicines just because you're older. And if you've achieved a degree of disease stability, maybe that's because of the medicine. So, so maybe your disease is quiet because the medicine's working. So, so, you know, for example, I take a cholesterol medicine because of, I, I have high cholesterol. So thanks a lot, dad. I, I have high cholesterol. 
should I take it until I'm 55 and then let myself have a heart attack because I had a good 55 years? So now it's okay if I have a heart attack? I think not. And just because you have MS and you made it to your sixth, sixth decade of life, does that mean that you should stop trying to treat your disease? No. Again, in a worm that rhymes with ho, no. Will you tell us how you really feel, please? Uh, later. I don't want to talk about it right now. <laughs> All right. We have another question from uh, Anna Radha. Um, she's, uh, she has a question in chat, but she is also on the line with her hand raised. Please go ahead. Anu Rana? Hello? Uh, no, not Hello, Dr. There we are. Master. This is Anuradha. Thank you so much for all you do. And I'm a Twitter fan, as many of us on the line are. Thank you. I have a question for you about the I have a question about the contrast agent that we use for the MRI. The gadolinium or gadavist versus the others, the macros, macro cyclic versus linear. And how do we get to the linear one? Because the facility I am going to tomorrow, as a matter of fact, does not offer it unless the EOVIST is for a stomach scan. Ah, okay. So, so this is, again, a very, very um, enlightened educational question. So it's a, it's, it's a delight to see you. Please send me a hello, howdy, hi on Twitter. It would make my day. Um, and, and the question is a very enlightened question. So when we do an MRI, and halfway through the MRI, they pull you out of the scanner, and then they inject you with a dye in the IV, which makes you feel like you're going to pee your pants. Um, that dye is a contrast agent called gadolinium. And there has been a lot of popular press and scientific literature with concerns about gadolinium, right? There are two major concerns. Major concern number one is the gadolinium has to be processed and excreted through the kidneys. And so if you have a kidney dysfunction, we need to think seriously about the safety of the gadolinium. And if you're not sure if you have a kidney dysfunction, um, I think it's a best practice actually to check a creatinine level to make sure that you're not spilling protein from your kidneys, um, to make sure that it's safe from a kidney standpoint to have the contract. So that's the first thing. If your kidney function is normal, I'm not worried about it. If your kidney function is abnormal, then I think that we need to look further. Now, the second concern with contrast is whether or not it gets stuck in the brain. And the term we use is sequestration. So that's a, that's a scrabble word. Sequestration means it's, it's trapped inside the brain. And as you already pointed out, there are two kinds of contrast molecules, linear and macrocyclic. So linear is bad and macrocyclic is good. And so if, if you're not sure which, which drug the, the MRI suite is using, then you can ask them. Like, so for example, um, where in the area where I work, there aren't any linear molecules. So all of the uh, hospital systems near me and all of the MRI suites near me have all adopted using macrocyclic molecules. And the macrocyclic molecules don't sequestrate in the brain. They're all gotten rid of. Linear molecules, not so much. And so it's reasonable to ask what, which kind of molecule are, is it linear or macrocyclic, all right? And so I think that's an important question to ask. Um, if they say they're only using linear molecules and you're concerned, then the question becomes, do you bother getting contrast? Now, the way I look at an MRI is if you get an MRI for MS and it's a diagnostic MRI, I really, really, really need contrast. Like it's super important. And in fact, the diagnostic criteria for MS leverage contrast enhancement to help make the diagnosis. Once you've been diagnosed with MS, we use the MRI differently. We use it for different purposes. We're doing it to monitor the disease. And if I can choose, I would choose to get contrast every single time because I learn more. I learn more from an MRI with contrast than I do without. But 
I want to point out that I learn a lot even without the contrast. I would say to you that I learn probably 75%, maybe 80% of what I want to learn without contrast. So I tell patients, it's my preference that you have contrast with macrocyclic molecules. But if you say you don't want to, I don't have a, a shouting match with you. I just say, okay. It's just that I won't learn as much information. I'll still learn a lot of information. I just won't learn as much. So I think as a human being receiving a medicine or receiving a contrast dye, you have every right to ask, wait, excuse me, is this macrocyclic or is it linear? And if it's linear and I don't want it, you're not allowed to give it to me. They're not allowed to do that if you don't want it done. And I think that the best case scenario is to have the conversation with your neurologist prior to having the scan. And if your neurologist isn't up to date on the different kinds of contrast, then this is an opportunity to share with her or him and say, it turns out that I'm not inclined to take macrocyclic molecules. Can you please help me make sure that it's done that way? If the ordering physician <coughs> writes contrast only use macrocyclic molecules, the radiology team is obligated to try to act to do exactly what they've asked. And so that's a place where I would start. That is a really, really good question. I'm delighted that you asked it, and I'll look forward to hearing from you on Twitter. Uh, okay, we have um, two more questions. How's your juice? How um, you well, the apple uh, juice is over, but uh, the big uh, boss has not given me the you're done signal. So let's do the two questions. Two questions. Um, is, uh, is This one is from Candace. Uh, no, we have Thank you so much. Uh oh. I I was not able to understand that very clearly. And I don't think it was because of apple juice. No, 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 no. So we have a question from Cand uh, Candace. Is all exercise equal or there are some really super awesome ones that we should focus on? Walking, yoga, karate, etc. That's a really good question. So the very, very best type of exercise, like hands down, the very best type of exercise, the best exercise for MS is the exercise that you're willing to do. For real. The very best exercise for treating multiple sclerosis is the exercise that you don't hate. Because if you hate doing the exercise, you're not going to do it for very long. Like, for example, I'm not a runner. Like if you chased me with a gun, I would run for a little bit and then I would try to hide because I would get winded, right? So I'm not a, I'm not a guy that likes to run. Um, and so if you made me run, I wouldn't do it for very long. I'd do it for a couple of weeks and then I'd stop. There is no science in 2020 that proves that exercise A is better than exercise B. We don't, we, we don't have that data right now. So I want you to do the kind of exercise that you are willing to do on a continual basis. If you remember what I said earlier, I want it to be part of your lifestyle. I want you to exercise as part of your lifestyle. So if you love doing ballroom dancing and you ballroom dance a couple times a week, crush that ballroom dancing. If you like capoeira or you like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, or if you are a, a, a student of karate, that's awesome. Do that. If you enjoy sweating to the oldies or doing water Zumba, do that. I want you to like the exercise that you're doing. Now, all things being equal, I mentioned that water is particularly valuable, all right? So water-based exercises sometimes are helpful when land-based exercises are not. And so that's just the thing to think about. Um, now, when I think about the constructs of exercise, there's really four areas I want you to consider. Core strengthening. So that's not your massive bicep, that's your core. So strengthening your belly, your back, your butt, your, your hips. Strengthening the core is one of the things that I think is really important for MS. Number two is flexibility. So stretching is actually really, really valuable in MS. Number three is cardiovascular endurance. And number four is balance. So when I'm thinking about exercises, the ideal exercise would have some of those components, right? 
And, and if you think about like Tai Chi or you think about yoga or Pilates, they have all those things in them oftentimes. But if the thing that you love is badminton or the thing that you love is powerlifting and, and you're willing to do that, then I want you to do that because you're going to be better off as adopting a part of your lifestyle to be exercise that you enjoy than anything else. Now, if in 2021, some research comes out that says the only answer is blankety blank. Okay. Well then next year, I'll tell you about that. But today I want you to do the exercise that you don't think stinks. That's the kind I want you to do. All right. And for the final question, uh, let's see here. Let me pull it back up. Uh, it is about spasticity. And have you seen cases of spasticity that cause ex extertional compartment syndrome? Am I saying that right? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. So we're talking about spasticity. That I'm familiar yeah. with. Um, what was the word before compartment syndrome? Uh, ex uh, exertional? Like yeah. maybe, um, I'm not exactly sure, but I'll take a guess. All right. So if I butcher the answer, um, I apologize. I didn't fully understand the question. So spasticity is very common in MS. In fact, 70% of people with MS experience some form of spasticity. And spasticity manifests in three ways. You can have spasms, limbs that shake. You can have a cramp like a Charlie horse where your muscle cramps up and hurts really bad. Or you can have limbs that are hard to bend. Now, the most common complications of spasticity are joints that no longer bend. So you can have a contracture and you literally can't fully range the joint or because you're positioned in a certain way and there's pressure, you can have pressure sores on your heels or your buttocks or what have you. Spasticity is very, very painful. Now they asked about compartment syndrome, which is something a bit separate and I've never seen spasticity and compartment syndrome. Um, and so I apologize, I can't flush out the question adequately. Maybe just to end on a comprehensive note, maybe we'll take one more question if you have one cooking. Uh, there was one more um, that came in and it was uh, from Josh Wolf. Uh, Josh, he wanted your thoughts on cannabis. Uh, now, how could we possibly have an MS open forum and not talk about ganja? I think it would be almost uh, inappropriate not to talk about cannabis as it relates to MS. So, so um, I, uh, full disclosure, I am a medical marijuana recommender uh, here in the great state of Ohio. And um, I'll start by saying that the science behind cannabis is really bad. I'm not saying cannabis is really bad. I'm saying the science behind cannabis leaves a lot to be desired. The, the trials done to study cannabis have not been amazing. And that doesn't mean it doesn't work. Just that the science to study it leaves a lot to be desired. We definitely need more research. There's no question about it. Now, that being said, anecdotally, I think that there are certain symptoms that cannabis helps a bunch in MS. And where did I come up with this if the science is bad? I, I came up with it by talking to 70 year old ladies. Now, let me explain what I mean. When a 20 something who spends most of his day high as a kite tells me that marijuana is awesome, dude. I, I, I accept what he says, but I kind of wonder if he just doesn't like getting high. No shame in that game, but it kind of makes me wonder. But when a 70 something church marm who doesn't drink any alcohol tells me privately that she doesn't need me to refill her pro vigil or her lyrica because if she takes a little hit of some hashish that her grandson gave her, she has no pain and sleeps through the night. I, I don't think she's lying to me. I don't think hundreds upon hundreds of patients all got together and said, let's tell Aaron that it helps with pain and spasticity. Like, I don't think they did that. And I think that anecdotally it can be very, very helpful. So, so I wanted to become a medical marijuana recommender. Now, I will share an opinion that I've developed as a medical marijuana recommender. I think that if you take 
cannabis, and this is paper, not cannabis, but pretend it's cannabis, and you light it on fire, and so now it's on fire, and then you breathe in the smoke, I think that's rather pro-inflammatory. In the same way that smoking tobacco is pro-inflammatory, I think if you light cannabis on fire and then suck in the smoke, it can be pro-inflammatory, not just to the lungs, but everywhere. And so if I was choosing, I would not recommend that you smoke cannabis. Compared to smoking cannabis, my opinion is that it's probably a bit safer to vaporize cannabis. So when you vape cannabis, what you're doing is you're heating it up below the level of combustion. So it's not lighting on fire, there's no smoke, but you're releasing all these vapors that include cannabinoids. Cannabinoids is a doctor term for THC and CBD. It's the psychoactive um, and chemical that we're looking for in the, the cannabis. And then you breathe that in. And I'm not completely sure that that's 100% safe, but it's way safer than smoking. My opinion is that eating cannabis, so edibles, is the least pro-inflammatory. It's the least pro-inflammatory to your body. And when I'm trying to help a person who is cannabis naive figure out whether or not a cannabinoid might help pain, spasticity, or some other symptom, I like to start with edibles. And, and that doesn't make me right. It, it, it just makes me opinionated. Um, but I definitely think that there is a role for cannabinoids. I don't think it's a panacea. I don't think it slows down MS. But I think that with the right patient, it can markedly help some really, really annoying symptoms. And so I think it's worthwhile considering. And hence the reason that I became a medical marijuana recommender. Excellent question. And thank you for asking it. All right. Way to uh, uh, high note to end on right there. Sorry. There you go. Um, so, uh, so that is all the time we have uh, for right now. We did go over time by about half an hour. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, if you missed any part of this conference, we are going to replay it um, on msfocusradio.org and on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud uh, page and our YouTube page. Remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for access uh, times and, and information as well. Uh, where, where, do you, what are your, uh, where can people find you? How can people uh, find your... So, so first of all, let me just say that if you guys aren't uh, actively involved with MS Focus and MS Foundation, you need to because they're amazing. They just brought you uh, this evening. Um, they do great work. And so we most certainly want to give them a thank you and we want, we want to support them in their efforts because they really do great stuff. Um, so I, I am uh, present on social media. Uh, you can check me out on Twitter at Aaron Boster MD. So just my name. Uh, you can check me out on Facebook, Aaron Boster MD. Not very creative, easy to remember. Uh, and you can check me out where I spend most of my social media time, and that's on YouTube. Uh, and so I have a YouTube channel. There's about almost 22,000 uh, followers at this point. It's really an honor. Um, I put out a new uh, YouTube video every Monday morning. I put out one this morning on pseudo bulbar affect. Um, and so you can check me out on YouTube at Aaron Boster, MD. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Boster. It's always great to have you on. So much energy, and, and we appreciate uh, all the information you've given us, and, and it's always wonderful to see you. Um, uh, join us uh, with Dr. Uh, Herb, uh, actually, uh, Herb Karpatkin. He's a physical therapist. He's going to be um, talking with us about exercising at home during the summer. Uh, this Thursday, June 11th, at uh, 1, 30, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So make sure you pre-register for the conference at msfocus.us um, uh, or go to msfocus.com and you can register there as well. Casey wanted to mention uh, a special conference tomorrow on Zoom. Yes, tomorrow night, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation in cooperation with the Shepherd Center uh, Can Causes Foundation and MS Views and News will be presenting a conference on MS and cannabis therapy. Um, we, it will be a panel discussion with Dr. Ben Thrower, Dr. Woo! Jacqueline Rosenthal, um, Aaron Sieber of Canna Causes, and Christine Werner, who's a patient advocate. So if you want to go into more detail about the 
topic of cannabinoids and MS. We hope that you'll join us and you can find the registration information for that on the foundation's social media pages. Now, just to piggyback off what she's sharing, if you guys don't know my friend Ben, he's uh, amazing. Uh, he's one of the um, most experienced, uh, most amazing MS neurologists in the United States. He's also uh, been a very, very large advocate of, of cannabinoids in MS, and he's a brilliant, brilliant man who frequently dresses like a pirate. I, I absolutely <laughs> love Dr. Thrower. I, I learned a lot from him myself, and you guys are in for a treat tomorrow. So make sure that you come back tomorrow night and learn from them. That sounds like an awesome panel of discussion. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Boster. Take and care, guys. You've been in rare form tonight. Thank you so much. It was entertaining. <laughs> Take care. It was great talking to you. Have a super night. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.